Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Calvary. It's good to see everybody this morning. If you'll stand, we're going to begin with a song of worship. Time to turn to greet somebody this morning. It'd be fun uh, for you to hear another uh, story of Jason. Um, <clears throat> he wants you to be sick of me soon. <laughs> uh, he was uh, in the process of being ordained. How long ago was this? Uh, it was 2002. 2002? Yeah. How'd it go? Not well. Not well. <laughs> okay, um, would you like to share yeah, about it? Yeah, actually. What, what is ordination? Because a lot of people well, don't know Well, ordination, I, I'm originally from the Christian and Missionary Alliance, uh, which is the denomination that I was raised in uh, as a pastor. Um, and there is a long 
arduous process to get to ordination, um, about four years worth of work, degree work, all that stuff. And then you go up before ordination board um, and... They do oral questions. Oral questions, okay. yeah. And in fact, uh, what I didn't tell you was my pastor fast-tracked me. He made me kind of go around. So when I, when I got up to the board, um, I was able to kind of get around most of what all the other pastors had to do. So I went in there with them going, this kid better know what he's talking about. Because <laughs> all the other people had to go through a bunch of things to get there. And I kind of skipped a bunch to get there because he was confident that I was ready. And well... You were. No, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so they asked the questions, didn't work? So yeah, what, what they asked the questions. Uh, I was totally flustered, totally just didn't, couldn't, you know. And they purposely asked the questions in different ways. Yeah. I was expecting it a different way, and I just got flustered. And by the end of it, um, they um, said, we, we believe you have a call to ministry, but we just think you need some more time. And I remember driving home uh, with, with my old pastor, Dave, and uh, he could sense I was frustrated. And he goes, just let it out. And so I, you know, let him have it the whole ride home and was frustrated, mad at him. And another story was he was leaving on a three-month sabbatical. He had told the church the, the day before I went to my ordination, pray for Pastor Jay. He's going up for his ordination. And, uh, of course, he was leaving the next day, and I was supposed to leave the church for three months. So I had to go up there and go, yeah, I'm not good enough to be your pastor because I failed. But, hey, <laughs> follow me for three months. So, so you end up, he gave you someone to work with. Yes. He, well, he didn't. Uh, the district superintendent, Reverend Richard Bush, um, gave me a mentor uh, that he thought would uh, fit my needs at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that, my pastor, Dave, was one of my biggest mentors, but uh, he, he felt I needed something else. So I went to see a Reverend Art Warner who had been in ministry for years. In fact, when I walked into his room, he had a college paper on the wall framed that was commented on by A.W. Tozer. That's how old the dude is. <laughs> he was the chaplain for the Patriots in 1980 because uh, he, was, he was a senior pastor at a church in Foxborough. And I walked in, and I'm, like, intimidated as all get out. And uh, we sat down, and I'm thinking I'm in here for theology, and, you know, he's going to help me with my theology. And the first question he asked me was, how's your relationship with your father? To which I went, are you kidding me? I'm not here to see a shrink. I was mad. <laughs> I'm like, what is this about, mad? And, of course, by the end of the time, he had me blubbering and crying and you know, figuring out that I had deeper issues than I thought. I thought I was going in there for theology lessons, and what I learned really quickly was that I just had some deep-seated hurts from the past that I needed to deal with, and that for that year and beyond, uh, he was a huge uh, mentor, uh, discipler for me, and still uh, called me just the other day, 83 years young, walking a mile and a half twice a day, traveling and preaching at churches all over the, uh, New England. Calls himself a people millionaire. He loves people, loves... He's... Just uh, an amazing man, amazing man. Very cool. So yeah. th did you ever go back and do the ordination piece? I did. I got ordained in 04. Uh, okay. He actually preached at my ordination. Okay. Um, and uh, like I said, the next time I went back, I knocked it out of the park. It was pretty simple. There you go. <laughs> now, you mentioned something about when you were in the military. Yes. Uh, uh, Garcia. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I learned from this his mentorship and other people that have discipled me along the way. And it's one of the things that I instill in whatever staff or leadership that I have in student ministry. And I think anyone that's been in any type of ministry, lay leadership or full-time leadership understands. And that is if you're going to do ministry, you have to be long-term minded. Uh, if you try to gauge your success in ministry on a day-to-day -day basis, you get frustrated because you don't automatically, obviously always see results. So Isaiah 55 has always been my Go to scripture for my staff and for myself that the word of the Lord does not come back void. It accomplishes what he sets it out to do, and you just have to be long-term minded. And uh, PFC Garcia is one of the examples that I give in that. When I was in the Army, uh, I accepted Christ at 13, but I never had a church that helped me, you know, mm -hmm. um, get established. So I kind of was so my wild. I was doing my own thing in the military. And he came to me when I was at Fort Hood, Texas, and he would knock on my door every Sunday, invite me to church. I started to go to church, started to get back into things. He even gave me his car. Um, and then after a while, uh, every time he knocked on my door, I'd hide in my room, wouldn't answer the door. I'd run away from him. Uh, he kept coming, and I kept ignoring him. And I use him as an example because I guarantee you, you know, that he is probably sitting somewhere today, and if he heard my name, he'd probably go, waste of my time, kick the dust off my feet, didn't have any effect whatsoever. But what he doesn't know is the seeds that he watered and planted were huge. And if he could see what God has done in my life, he would see that the work that God had him do in that moment in my life did have an effect, did 
serve a purpose. And I wish I could thank him, but Garcia is kind of like Smith in the Hispanic thing, so I can't find PFC Garcia is all I knew him as, so I can't find him to thank him. But I know that when he goes to be with the Lord that he'll hear yeah, well done yeah. for just the effort that he put. Even so, though it didn't so seem. mentoring as far as the youth go is really important. It is, it is at the core of what I hope to accomplish mm -hmm. uh, because, like I said, Bible studies, prayer groups, all those things are wonderful, and we'll do them. But I think the idea of mentorship, discipleship, whatever you want to call it, but that idea of living life together and walking hand-in-hand -hand with students is huge. And that's why I think the family aspect of that is huge. Cool. So. Good job. Thank you. thank you. Can we say thank you? <laughs> You are my strength. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Reaches to me. You are my
How many of you have uh, bought a home, purchased a home? Probably a good 50% of you anyway. Now, if you were going to purchase a home, but it was in a, across the country and you couldn't go there to, uh, you know, look at the house, what would you do? Just give me some feedback. What, what would you do as far as uh, you're going to purchase this home, but you can't go there? What are you going to do? You're going to go to the internet and do what? See, so you can find maps, uh, maybe a picture of the house. Anything else? Okay. Where's the trusted friend, though? They're here. Oh, that are here. <laughs> okay. Call a church, a local church. And do what? Okay, trying to figure out the neighborhood. Anything else? Contact a realtor. Contact a realtor. Now that's creative. <clears throat> Somebody who knows the business, right? It's a good idea. Apparently not, George. Okay, contact somebody who's been there. Number one most asked question, it, 
when we asked that question, like, what would you like to ask God, was what is heaven like? It's very common. There was all sorts of questions that went along with that. And so I'm going to spend two weeks on it. This week I'm going to talk about what is heaven like. And interestingly enough, the Bible talks about heaven. So we have uh, some interesting information. And I hope it's uh, helpful to you. So we're going to talk about what is heaven like. I mean, what's it look like? Where is it? All that kind of thing. Next week we're going to talk about who's going to be there and what are we going to do? There's a lot of questions on what are we going to do there forever. You know, it sounds, how can we do that? So we'll talk about that next week. If you've got somebody that you're trying to witness to and they've got questions on heaven, uh, it would be a great time to, to bring them. So this morning is, what is heaven like? And I kind of think it's like, it's this distant land. And how are you going to know what it's look like? Because you can't go there. You can't hit it on the internet. Well, you can, you can hit it on the internet and get everyone's perspective of what it might be. And that's kind of interesting. I don't know if anybody went and checked out what hell is like on the internet <laughs> last week. But I didn't use any of those slides here because it's just uh, freak people out. Well, heaven is kind of the opposite. It's like the best of the best. But what I want to do is actually go to the Word of God. What's the Word of God say about it? And see, <clears throat> we have somebody actually who's there. His name's God. And he's written a book. Parts of it, parts of his book are written about it. So I thought, you know, that's pretty good. He's not a real estate agent per se. He just owns everything. And, uh, <clears throat> but he's been there and he lives there. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to hear what God has to say about it? What you're going to find out is that heaven is a great place. You want to make sure you go there. And there's some requirements, and we've talked about those many, many times on how to get there. But what are we going to, if we're going to spend the rest of our life, the eternity after this life is done, wouldn't it make sense for us to do a little research on that and figure it out? So I've done some uh, homework here, and I hope it's helpful. If you didn't get a, a, uh, some notes, just raise your hand. One of the ushers would be happy to get you uh, these. They're kind of discussion builders, and I hope that you can take these and go uh, out to lunch or talk with family or whatever on these types of things. So let's look at the, the first concept here is that there are three heavens described in the Bible. So you don't always know when they say they look up into heaven, we're thinking, you know, that's where God is, but <clears throat> that's not necessarily true. So the first is the realm is called Earth's atmosphere. It's really when we look out and we see the sky and the clouds where jets fly through, birds fly through. That's the first heaven. And that's listed in Job 35.5. It's constantly changing. Earth has a beautiful first heaven. The second heaven is the stellar universe. It's where all the stars are. It's where the, the universes are. It's uh, amazing on a clear night. When there's not too bright of a moon, you can see just an amazing array of things. I love going on the internet and checking some of those pictures uh, from the Hubble uh, telescope that's out there. But they have not come to the end of it. They still don't know how many stars there are. It's a phenomenal thing. In galaxies, in Psalm 147.4, it says that God has made every one of those stars, placed them exactly where he wants, and knows them by name. Knows them by name. I mean, I have trouble remembering my three boys' names, you know? <laughs> and uh, he remembers all these billions and billions of stars. It's a phenomenal place. That's called the second heaven. But the third heaven is the abiding place of God in all his glory. Psalm 103, 19 talks about that. So that's where the holy angels are. That's where the throne of God is. Apostle Paul was caught up into the third heaven and God allowed him to see that and he says there was inexpressible things, things he couldn't talk about They were so amazing in heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4 is where Paul talks about that. And it was just a, a privilege that God gave to him and he couldn't actually even describe it. So the question really, begging question is this is, where is heaven? Is it a real place? It's a real place. The Bible talks about it. Jesus talked about it. 
regularly. And really what I would say, the best way to say where heaven is, because you can't go by MapQuest and type in heaven and say, where is it? Because you can't find it that way. There's not Bible verses on where it is. It talks more about what it is and who's going to be there. Heaven is how I de uh, define it is where God is. Heaven is where God is. That's where heaven is. Turn with me to Acts 1. Verse 10. That's interesting because right after Pentecost, when uh, Christ was here on earth, after his resurrection, he spent 40 days on earth, and then he was taken up into the clouds. It says this. I'll, actually, I'll start. Actually, I'll start in verse 8. Actually, let's start in 7. Acts 1, 7. Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And he said this, after he said this, he, meaning Jesus, was taken up before their very eyes in a cloud, hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. You ever watch a balloon, you know, that some kid let go of, and you just... Watch it, and you watch it, and you watch it, and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then finally you blink, and then you can't find it again. Well, that's kind of, I think, Jesus was being lifted up. The angel said this. While they're looking intently into the sky as Christ was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood next to them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven... So that is where he is now. We'll come back in the same way that you've seen him go into heaven. And Christ will come one day. The Bible says he'll step down on the Mount of Olives. And there'll be a great earthquake. And it'll split the ground. And it'll open directly into Jerusalem. So the third heaven is where God is. Now I heard tell of a Russian cosmonaut, this is back uh, years ago now, uh, he went up into do his orbit around Earth, and he looked for God while he was up there, and he didn't see him. And so his conclusion, there is no God. And I'm sure that God just had a belly laugh on that one, you know, because he's the one that's created all of this. It's interesting because in Psalm 145, 18, it says, The Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth. I just think that's really interesting that uh, even though God is in heaven and we can't see it and it seems distant and far, far away, is that in a moment's call, he's there. I think that's pretty awesome. That we can have instant access to God. The focus in the Bible is not the location of heaven as much as it is about what it's like and trying to give us a taste of that we want to be there. As much as hell is for separation and punishment, heaven is for fellowship, eternal joy, and worship. One of the uh, pictures I did not use last week on the definition of hell is this, which I think is kind of an interesting um, picture. It's a picture of a long, long table with all sorts of food on it, like just tons of food. It's a big uh, festival. There's only, and there's people s s sitting on each side of the table. The only problem is, is they have spoons and forks strapped to their arms, and they're about this long. And so you cannot feed yourself. You have to feed someone else on the opposite side of the table. And because you're in hell, <clears throat> there's all the focus is on yourself and, and you, but you can't feed yourself. Somebody else has to feed you, and you have to feed somebody else. And no one's doing that. And so there's big angst and anger and frustration because everyone is doing their own thing. And uh, I kind of think that's an interesting thought to think about. So when you get home today at lunch and you're trying to feed yourself, think about that. 
So anyway, heaven is not like that at all. There will be a feast there that God is preparing for us. And uh, I think it's going to be an amazing time. So the question is, what will not be in heaven? This is one of the ways to uh, help explain this. Number one, nothing impure or anyone deceitful or shameful will be there. In other words, there's not going to be sin. There's not going to be this impurity because God is holy. Revelation 21, 27 says this, Nothing impure will ever enter, no one, uh, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And we've talked about that before, about coming to Christ and admitting you're a sinner and uh, repenting and asking Christ's forgiveness um, by his death on the cross. You apply that to your life through him. And that's how you get your name written in the book of life. The second item that will not be there. I'd like you to turn it to Revelation 21, please. Revelation 21 says this. 21.4. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Probably 25 years ago, maybe more, I was, in, uh, I was a pastor in Elmhurst, Illinois, which is in the western suburbs of Chicago. And they had the uh, moving wall come. It was the Vietnam War Memorial that was in a big semi-truck. And they would take it and they would set it up with I don't know how many um, stones. Does anybody know how many stones there was? There was probably like 40 or so stones. It's just like the War Memorial in uh, Washington, D.C. But they, would set, they set it up in the park there. And they asked if I would address uh, the people f from a pastoral perspective. And I said, I would love to do that and pray for them. And so we got there and there was hundreds of people there. And uh, they would take out their pieces of paper and they'd take charcoal and they'd go and they'd, they'd rub on the... On the uh, panels and you could get the name of your uncle or father or daughter or whoever it was that had been uh, died during the Vietnam War and uh, during the program they turned to me and I read that verse because there's a lot of people weeping and I said this you know we are here now remembering those who passed on before us to give us freedom. And it's very sorrowful, and many of us have lost many people. But one day, Christ is going to return. And when that happens, we'll be in glory with him. And he says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be more, no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. I thought, what a, what a privilege as a Christian to know that. You know, we look around in our world and we see a lot of suffering of people. But that's the results of sin. Sin has tarnished the world. And Christ came and died on the cross to set that whole thing free. I mean, there had to be a penalty for that. The wages of sin is death. And so he took the hit for us. And so, you know, when, when he says there's not going to be any more mourning or crying or pain, that's pretty awesome. I think of so many of you work in the hospital here locally and uh, just realizing how much of stuff goes on and people in anguish and struggle. And yet with Christ, there's a new way to look at that. So that's what heaven is going to be like. It's not going to be any of that. The other, another thing, number three, that's not going to be there is there's not going to be any more time. As we know, no more chronological time. In other words, these, these watches that we have that we can time everything with and keep track of what time it is, they aren't going to work anymore. I don't know if you remember the drama that we did a couple weeks ago, but kept clicking on his watch. It wasn't working right. Well, in heaven, none of your watches are going to work. 
Cell phones aren't going to work. A lot of things aren't going to work anymore. And it's because there's no more time. Time as we know it, which is a 24-hour period, is gone. I'll just read uh, 2 Peter 3.8. 2 Peter, uh, Peter wrote on this, and it's kind of interesting. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like, he didn't say is a thousand years. He says it's like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow to keeping his promises. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with fire and the earth and everything and it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. The whole promise there is of God coming again and uh, the reason there's not going to be any time is uh, stated. Go to Revelation 21, and let's just read a couple verses here. This is uh, Revelation 21 and 22 are descriptions of heaven. And uh, in verse 22, it says this. Uh, this is John the, writing about it. I did not see the temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine, for the glory of God gives it light. Remember Jesus said, I am the light of the world? Well, now he is the light. And the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of earth will bring splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so he's talking about it. there's not going to be any night anymore. It's just going to be light because that's who God is. And so you don't have that 24-hour day-night period. So it's, time is when you're heading toward eternity, it doesn't matter anymore. That's really hard to wrestle with. That, you got to wrestle on that one. But that's what it says. Number four is no moon or sun. Number five is no night. And number six is no temple. Uh, it says Jesus is the temple. So what's going to happen is, is in Revelation 21, let's look at one. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice of the throne saying, Now is the dwelling of God with men, and I will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. That's when he says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain in the old order has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. You guys like to have new things? I think something new is good. Sometimes I like the smell of new. You know? And God says he's going to make it all new. So the earth that we have and the heaven that we know of is going to be gone one day. It's going, that's just going to be gone. And he says, I'm going to bring a new earth, a new city, and it's going to be called the New Jerusalem. So in your notes here, it says, we will reside in the New Jerusalem. And it states how big it is. It's 1,400 miles cubed. So 1,400 miles long, wide, and high. It's this cube. That's how John describes it. Now, 1,400 miles is uh, hard to figure out, but it's, uh, if you think about it, 
It's about 1,500 miles from here to, from Rutland, Vermont to Miami, Florida. That's 1,500 miles. And it's about 1,600 miles from here to Denver. So take that as a cube. That's what the New Jerusalem is, the Bible says. And um, that's where we will live. I put in your notes, it's roughly the size of our moon. I haven't been to the moon recently, so I, but that's just <laughs> math in me that, that has to do that. Revelation 21, 18 talks about the, the city. Um, actually, the, uh, the dimensions are over in uh, Revelation 21, verse 16, and it talks about 12,000 stadia. That's about 1,400 miles. The wall is about 200 thick around this city. And it has all these, it's made of gold. And it has all these uh, gems in it. If you read the next uh, verses there, it talks about 12 different gems, some of which we don't even know what they are. But they must be beautiful. And they're scattered on the wall. And so it looks like a rainbow of color. So the beauty of what this new Jerusalem is going to be is going to be some phenomenal piece. It mentions uh, <clears throat> that there'll be 12 gates, and each of the gates will have a single, it'll be made out of a single pearl. And there'll be streets of gold. Now I have a, a story which is a legend. And I thought I would read that. It's just a legend, but just think about it. It has an interesting point. I love the story of a rich man who at his deathbed negotiated with God to allow him to bring his earthly treasures with him when he came to heaven. God's reaction was that this was the most unusual request. But since this man had been exceptionally faithful, permission was granted to bring along just one suitcase. The time arrived and the man presented himself at the pearly gates, suitcase in both hands. Actually, since he had stuffed it with as many bars of gold bullion as he could find fit into it. St. Peter said, uh, sorry, you know the rules. You can't take that with you. But the man protested. God said I could, just one suitcase. St. Peter checked, found out that there could be one exception this time, prepared to let the man in. And he said, oh, but uh, let me examine the contents before you pass. He took the suitcase, opened it, and saw the bars of gold and asked quizzically, you brought pavement? <laughs> now, <clears throat> we look at pavement as toxic waste here. And so in heaven, the streets are paved with gold. Paved with gold, not just coated with gold, paved with gold. And that just talks about who God is. And so it's a commodity that is just pavement. Now, this is a legend. It's not true, of course, but because <clears throat> you can't take it with you, obviously. But the point is really an interesting point. The thing that we hold in such great high value and high commodity is nothing but pavement in heaven. You walk on it. If God is that amazing that he paves the streets with gold, think what he must be doing for us. Think about that. God is an amazing God. So my comment is Christians will be in heaven with Christ. You know, we talk about all these other things, but the reality is, is we'll be there in heaven with Christ. Christ himself, the maker of the universe and the sustainer of the universe, the great teacher, the great healer, the great savior. He'll be there. Somebody asked a question, a young person actually asked the question. They said, will we be able to talk to Jesus in heaven? I'm thinking, oh man, yeah. You got eternity, so time is not an issue. There might be a lineup, you know, but who cares? You can talk to him. 
And I think he'll give you great focused attention. It'll be just an amazing thing, you know? Imagine standing in his presence and asking him questions and letting him talk to you. There are some people that, uh, I've mentioned this before to other people, that <clears throat> they're great teachers. Um, Chuck Colson, for me, was a great teacher. Uh, Andy Stanley is a great teacher. And frankly, I don't really care what they talk about. Just talk. It, there's that interesting. You know, they just, they just have a perspective on life that is so amazing. It doesn't, I, I'll just go wherever they are mentally and listen. And I think that's how it'll be with Jesus. It's like, I don't know if any questions we'll have will be significant. It'll be just like, talk. I'll listen. So we'll spend time with this Jesus. And that's, next week we'll talk about who else is going to be there. Because I think there'll be some really awesome surprises in heaven when we get there, of who's going to be there. In this heaven, chapter 22, let's read another section of scripture here, 22 verses 1 through 5. The angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. That street, of course, was paved with gold. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and its servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the uh, light of a lamp or the light of a sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. That's part of the story of what heaven's going to be like. There'll be the tree of life. Remember the tree of life in the book of Genesis is that they were, the Adam and Eve were not allowed to eat from the tree of life. That's actually partly why they were banished away from the, the garden because if they ate of the tree of life, they would live forever. And God didn't want them to suffer that um, because they were now in their fallen state. And so he banished them from the city. But in heaven, that tree will be there and you're free to eat of it. It says the tree... His leaves are for healing of the nations. I don't quite know what that means, but God will do healing among people. And then finally, the last uh, point I have here is that Christ is preparing a place for us. Turn back to John chapter 14. The disciples were always asking questions on uh, what this is like because Jesus was always talking about heaven and the future and the kingdom. And so this is a little discussion they had here in John chapter 14. Christ is preparing a place in heaven for you and I as a Christian. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Now, in the old King James that I grew up with, it said many mansions. And so I've always thought about what heaven is going to like with these big mansions that I was getting a mansion. But the reality is that the word really means room. So you're going to get a room, but if Christ was a carpenter here on earth and he's had all this time, think what those rooms are going to look like. You know? So he's making us room to stay in. If that were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. So he was talking to his disciples and he was saying these things to them and he says, I want you to be with me. I'm going to go and I got to do some things. I got to prepare for you to come. And uh, then I want you to come. I'll come back and get you. Don't worry about that. And then you can stay with me in my place. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And this was the old doubting Thomas. He was just asking clarifying questions here. And this is the context where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, 
you do know him and have seen him, basically because you've seen me. Now, <clears throat> he was a carpenter here on earth. He's been building, and he's going to prepare a place for you and I. That's a pretty awesome thing. Now, <clears throat> when Don and I were dating, uh, one of the things that we often said, because she lived in Chicago area, and I lived in New Hampshire at the time, and <clears throat> we would travel to see each other, and we talk on the phone for hours, and, and we came up with this little saying, it's not where you're at, it's who you're with. Because it really didn't matter where you were, because you could always call, and I worked for the phone company that time, so I had a free phone, and we would talk for hours, and, and then we would every now and then get a chance to be with each other. And that was really an amazing uh, time, you know? And then time was always too quick. Well, when our... Uh, kids grew up. Uh, a couple years ago, we went over to Sweden. We had an awesome privilege. Our youngest son, Jim, got married and went on his honeymoon, and the whole family went over there and had this big celebration over in Sweden. And on the way back, we stopped off in Iceland um, and stayed there for four or five days. And what I did was, I didn't plan a thing. I said, I'm not planning anything. And so, Josh and Amy, our middle son, and his wife were there, and they planned everything. They got all the brochures, and they just planned the whole thing. So every day it would be a new adventure. And you know what? I didn't care where I was going. Because wasn't, it didn't matter where I went with, where I went. And we saw, you know, glaciers and, and waterfalls, like hundreds of feet waterfalls, and a thing called the Blue Lagoon. And it was just an amazing time. And it didn't matter where I went because it was who I was with. He was preparing all those places. He was figuring out all the maps. And he did most of the driving. Kind of with heaven, that's kind of how I feel. I'm really not too worried about heaven. Um, I think it's going to be an awesome place. We, as best we can picture it, you know, he's given us some descriptors here. But it's really who you're going to be with. That's the issue for me. And that is really awesome. We're going to talk next week more about that, about who's going to be there and what we're going to do. And it's not going to be boring. It's not going to be boring, even though you're going to spend eternity there, because it's who you're with. It's not where you are, it's who you're with. And I hope you've settled that in your heart today. If you haven't, you need to come to Jesus and say, you know what? I repent of my sin. I believe that you died on the cross for me. And you've said in your word, we just read this, you are the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through you. And I believe in that. And ask you to forgive me of my sin. And then you can be with God for the rest of eternity. Who wouldn't want to be there? Let's close. Thank you, Father, for this awesome privilege we've had of studying the scriptures. And I am actually grateful of what you've done to write all this down so that we have some ideas of what heaven is like. Especially because you're going to be there. And I think that's going to be magnificent. So I pray for each of our folks that are here today and those that are listening on the video that you would speak to their hearts, stir in their hearts, a hunger and thirst for righteousness. That they may read the scriptures themselves too and study to see that it's true and prepare to meet their maker. We love you, Lord, this morning. It's an awesome privilege to be here. In Christ's name we pray. If you'll stand, we're going to close in a time of worship. me from the 
highs and lows as seasons come and go.